hope everyone out there is having a lovely time with the fucking apocalypse because, you know, it's the only way to get through it is to have good times as the fucking world ends, so. Uh, do you yeah. think this is the end of the world, sincerely? Do you think the end is coming? I fucking hope it is the end of the world that we had before, and that's what's very exciting to think about what if from now on, yeah? Like, the idea that we used to have cheap flights all around the world and you could fly to fucking wherever for 20 quid uh, will be, it'll be like, uh, the, it'll be on an equivalent of having, like, lead pipes, you know? It'll be like, it seems like the fucking craziest thing in the world to future generations, and people will never really understand how we were quite able to do that, you know? So, hopefully so, that's all done. Yeah, hopefully so you're that's all be done. The, uh... Are you going to be the put it down punks? Like the the virus is going to slowly ebb away, and all that'll be left is the few smattered populations of uh, Britain and uh, a team of punks going around going, "No, put that down, stop that, enough of that now, thank you." <laughs> it's what it feels like already, right? I mean, uh, it feels like kind of. everyone's like locked away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone's everyone's in the bunker. Yeah, we're never getting out of the bunker. Like it's just going to be like this. And you might have in the future what they're talking about. They might let small numbers of people out at certain times. But certainly what you're going to see is a much more highly regulated society. Uh, so, um, you know, in terms of like, all the stuff that we took for granted in terms of wandering around, protesting, meeting in actual in person, all of that, so, which is the main reason I'm doing this. This will be my first ever live stream to do this kind of thing. Okay. Uh, because I think that's probably going to be the future of it, you know? I, suppose I don't think we'll a... have festivals anymore in the future. Well, we will see. I Unless you have a... an immunity passport, you know? Well, we can talk about that in a second. I suppose it's a natural time to, to, to sort of say a bit more about who you are, to give a bit of context to people who are watching. Um, All right. Yeah, so your kind of creative output, and we can go on to, you know, origins and stuff like that after, but just for now, what do you do? What, what's your output? What has been your output historically? All right, I'm George F. Uh, I've been a spoken word artist for more than 10 years. I work with uh, various, very, I used to do workshops, I used to do like all kinds of things where you get like people together in a room and get them to do different things together. Uh, I also have written two books uh, based around squatting and autonomy uh, in London, uh, one in 2015 called Total Shambles, which is about seven years of squatting in London, and then one in 2020, it's out this year, called Good Times in Dystopia, which feels like one of the most appropriate titles of the year. Uh, it's all about autonomous spaces across the UK and uh, Europe and about the climate collapse, which everyone seems to have forgotten about at the moment. Like, that's, still, that's still happening, but like, yeah, it's still an important thing. You probably talk about that at some point. Uh, but also about like creative responses and also destructive responses to uh, the ongoing like, shitstorm that we live in. Are we allowed to swear on the live stream? I'm, I'm, not, I'm unsure can, of like, the boundaries. You, yeah. can sw you can swear. It's okay. Um, yeah. I, it's, not, it's not specifically made for children. It's not had the click to say made for children. So it won't be advertised towards children, if advertised at all. Um, it's not so a I wouldn't show, you yeah. Can, uh, not if fucking this was Blue puppet, Peter, is it? <laughs> mate, if, if this was a puppet show, there'd be a far greater amount of craft and technique put into it than there is at this specific moment. <laughs> So nice. Um, the stuff you do, stuff you do, the collaborative stuff. Um, is there a name for that? Is there a name for the the kind of school of the stuff you do? Because it's not the yeah. same as someone going and teaching, say, clown, is it, or or doing teaching a, a juggling workshop or something like that. No, it's called uh, theatre of the oppressed. So it works with. Um, so like from a guy called Augusto Boal, who was like uh, formerly a revolutionary back in the 70s in Brazil. And he figured out that you couldn't really go around uh, telling people to rise up for the revolution and like instructing them on what to do. His whole approach was around asking questions and around creating dialogue with people and being like, well, actually, what are the problems in your community? How do you want to solve them? And what do you think would be an option for you? You know, so, uh, yeah, we've been working with Theatre of the Oppressed for about 10 years and um it was largely around that I'm not wanting really to tell people how to live their uh, lives but actually to uh you know ask them what they think is the best way to solve their own problems you know so that's why how does um, that manifest then uh, how does manifest? that manifest yeah 
What do you mean? Beyond that, yeah? No, hmm. it's, um, so, I mean, you want these things, there's these qualities, there's these, um, these characteristics of the people who created it, but what is it functionally? When, it's, when you're there with the people doing it, how, do, how does it evolve? What's the, what's the actual mechanical thing happening? Do, do you understand oh, what, okay. I'm what I'm trying to... Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in, in the workshop setting... So, in the workshop setting, the way we talk about it is that you create a space for a rehearsal for life or a rehearsal for the revolution. So, it largely works around de-mechanizing the body through movement, through game playing, and then you start to get people to recreate scenes of real problems that they've experienced in their lifetime, and they'll replay them. You know, we normally talk about it in terms of like recreate a situation where you did not get what you want, you encountered what you didn't like, or you experienced an oppression of some sort. Then you play it out so it ends like with a defeat. You replay it like you didn't get what you want in that situation. Then we replay it, and at that point, other members of the audience get to intervene in it and to change what happens. Into, so they play out the same, the character who didn't get what they want, play it out in a different way, and try and get a different result. And the idea being around that you're encouraging people to be active and engaged in like looking at different options in situations where normally you might feel uh, defeated or unable to change what's going on. So, for example... In like, uh, the current environment, I guess you could talk about it in terms of there must be a lot of like, apathy or kind of like uh, frustration with the situation that's going on and people feeling like that maybe they're trying things and not really getting a different result out of it, you know? So you're looking at really finding different options that people could do in that situation. Maybe it is to stay at home and to respect that and find a creative output within there. I'll be honest with you, as I said, I've never done a live stream before, and I'm quite sceptical yeah. about the whole thing, because I don't like technology, it's a little bit stressful, a yeah. little bit last minute. Well, you, if, 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 if it makes you feel better, you're doing fine, you know, you're being, you're saying interest of you being yourself, you're just talking, you're, you're, giving, <laughs> you're giving, giving that stream of consciousness, give it, you know, guided by the question on, on what you think. Uh, I think uh, that's no problem with that, man. I have no yeah. problem with that. It was more like all the way here, I was just like, don't want to be sat on screen for a while. I don't like Skype or Zoom or anything like yeah. that. But I know that in the current environment, like, uh, it's important to like try these different things. I mean, this is like, the number yeah. of people I know who are doing workshops online or like having these conversations and also then broadcasting and sharing them live. Like right now, that's what seems to be. Uh, super important, super relevant to be doing, even though it's not yeah. my natural mode to be doing that, you know? Well, it kind of so, yeah. makes sense. In, in it's, it, this has really been a broad turn, I think, what's going on at the moment for, for mm. people in the arts and in creative industries who have, you know, mo mo through morality, um, not been working a lot of the time with bigger industrial stuff and all the rest of it and with the internet and just live performances. Because people think that's a better way to go. Yeah. You know, and uh, for those people, that morality has been, you know, snatched away by the fact that there's a contagion. Yeah. And the, the only moral thing to do is to not, you know, carry on this bloody contagion. And so yeah. it seems natural almost that we're, we're now in weird ground. I mean, I feel the same thing. I, I feel yeah. very strange talking to a camera. It denies yeah. all my instincts, you know. Um, I want a crowd of people around that I can in be intuitive with and work with, and you know. So talking about crowds and working with crowds, you did poetry, uh, kind of stand up poetry. What kind of? Do you like to elaborate a bit more about it? Sure. I mean, I spent years. Yeah. I started off in the slam poetry scene. That's how I got started. Was like uh, competing in slam competitions and. Um, with the aim yeah. to win and to be competitive and to, uh, you know, kind of enjoy it. it helped me get, like, a lot better fast, you know, to having that instinct. And then going to a lot what of is, open mics and going to a lot yeah. of spaces. Uh, sorry. What is, what is slam poetry, just for people who don't know? Slam poetry is, like, poetry sport. You have, like, uh, a number of poets in and you select judges from an audience and they will vote for the uh, different poets to go through to the next round and you'll have fewer and fewer so it's like a knockout version of poetry 
Uh, some people absolutely hate it because they consider it like uh, turning an art form into a competition. And for other people, like if you aren't really into poetry, which I wasn't, and I'm still not sure I am, but like <laughs> bits of it are fantastic. And it was a big part of like kickstarting the spoken word scene across the UK and in lots of places to create a lot of uh, spaces where people would step up and have open mic thing and it would be engaging with the audience. That was the key thing that really appealed is it would really go on audience response on the judges doing it and on getting that interaction between a crowd and the performer, which I think is absolutely fundamental. Yeah. And something that the, uh, the current dynamic that we've got going on is really going to have to work out is how do we include large numbers of people in online participation, what happens to uh what happens to the whole performance atmosphere if we were communicating like this I and mean, when you were saying it earlier it feels like you know we've all gone off into space that we're all in rocket ships now floating we're around in our modules trying, yeah in our modules you know we're all command we're all, we're, all, we're all major tom now yeah we're all yeah. major tom floating around and they're like trying to make contact with each other through it um and i think some stuff will come out for it i noticed that like yeah, I don't know. Do they normally in a lot of these things they have the option to like write comments and stuff on the bottom? Yes, uh, you can write comments. The, the issue you can write comments. People can comment if they want to. The issue with it is when you're um, writing comments, they come in thirty seconds later, and it's uh, a okay. little a little frustrating to try and play off doing them. But at some point, when we get comments through, we can uh, can talk about them, see what's going on with them. I'm interested. Sure, sure, with, sure. So I've talked to a lot of people about creative process most of the people i chat to on here uh either aged old school buskers or um <laughs> i've had uh amy on who is a kind of fine art directed um fetish performer talking about her kind of stuff but mostly wrinkly old street performers wrinkly it's old it's male it's street it's performers it's um and so i'm interested when i meet other people and chat with other people and broadcast this stuff for other people to see and hopefully be interested in the different creative approaches so you've you've gone to start doing this slam poetry this is your first performing experience first time you've gone into doing performance uh, for me there was a lot of stuff that happened at the same time uh i was doing doing theatre in school up until about 18 and then completely dropped out of it and focused, began to focus more on writing. And then around 24, like, uh, got back involved with the stage and uh, with workshops as well. So working with crowds in different levels of interactivity. And it was a lot around, you know, uh, I used to do... It was this balance of doing a lot, a lot of preparation and being really, really fucking ready and really, really on it and hitting all the different notes and having it totally, totally rehearsed to also being completely comfortable with complete freestyle and completely making it up and improvising and having that trust that like, if I just got out of my own way and allowed it to happen, it, it would be okay. And actually what, you, what, what I saw in a lot of performers and the nightmare of what I experienced as well is when you uh, get in your own way so much that you will completely choke or like every, everything will... Man, I'm making sound. I'm doing it right now. When you become too self-conscious about what's happening, you'll get in your own way and prevent it from naturally flowing out no matter how prepared or unprepared you are. It's about finding that balance between it. That would probably be my like... Uh, uh, like my nugget of wisdom on the whole thing is like really finding that balance between being fucking prepared for the moment when it happens, doing your technological stuff if that's the necessity now, or just rocking up and allowing it just to sort of flow out and trusting that it'll be okay because it'll be authentic if it's yeah. like you just letting it flow and letting it come out, you know? Um, and the, having a drug and alcohol habit could be a mixed edge blessing with that, you know. Like, you know, that can either yeah. like help you actually flow with it or completely like crash the plane into the fucking mountain, you know. So, um, yeah, watch out for that one. It, it's it's a wieldy weapon, um, booze and drugs and performance. You know, some mm -hmm. people manage to to you know dance around with with this big heavy fucking object, but then you can see other people get crushed under the weight of it. You know, some people dance around with it and they get crushed <laughs> after. Um, I've got yeah, a friend uh, who I interviewed uh, last week called Guy Collins who uh, says his theory is the best street performers that you see or a lot of the street performers you see earn a lot of the, the highest hats tend to be the people 
who've had the biggest drug problems, and so they've just sat there and yeah. focused and fed this thing. Yeah, it's yeah, a jokey yeah. fucking God, thing, but there is. We definitely know some of those. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we definitely well, have you, some friends who have done that. Yeah, you're you're a writer, and I know you you um you enjoy writery writery kind of writers. You know, so look at people like K. Dick and people like that, and yeah. they're all fucking bonkers, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So Philip K. Dick famously had a massive amphetamine habit, like uh, which is something that I've also been partial to in my past lives. But like, it was just in terms of by output and drive and wanting to go and go and go. And he would spend like day after day after day writing and writing and writing on speed until he absolutely collapsed, would pass out for three days and then would get up again and start again. So his output was incredible. But also it started to feed into the work that he was doing because a lot of his stuff, Philip K. Dick stuff is around... He, Famously did stuff like uh, Blade Runner is based on Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. Uh, Total Recall is based on some of his short stories. Minority Report is based on one of his books. Like look, The list goes on. It's been a huge, huge influence on modern culture in lots and lots of different ways. Uh, a scanner darkly could go on. Yeah. But like it's all around yeah. punching the wall between what is real and what is not. And the two defining, I'm just going to go off one about Philip K. Yeah, Dick now, carry on, mate. Up, but yeah. it was really around, is two defining questions were around, what is rea reality and what is human? And with what is reality, he defined it as reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. That's the only thing that's real. If you, if you, <laughs> if you don't believe in it and it's still there, that means it's a reality, which I fucking always loved, and which, like, in terms of people who experience psychosis in varying degrees, like, for them, it, you know, even if you know it's not real, it's still there, it's a, it's a form of reality. And this is something that, um, yeah, it's something that, like, working with a lot of people who are experiencing uh, various forms of psychosis on the daily, uh, and the difference between, like, when we do theatre... Like, when we do theatre, we, like, create something, and for a little while, we're believing it, and we know it's real, but it's not real at the same time, you know? Same with, like, uh, clowning performances, or street performances, or a lot of stuff where, you know, people are putting on an act, and you have this thing where, you know, you can go along with the clowning thing and believe it, and it's a reality for you, but if you don't believe it, it ceases, and it ceases to exist, it's not real. I make myself clear. I think this is an interesting point about the sort of real, like reality and authenticity in performance, and like yeah. really working towards. That's what a good poet will be able to do. A good street performer will be able to do. A good politician will be able to do is create a reality for someone else through what they're doing. Let's say like the writing, or whatever. If you believe it, then like you can go off on this whole fucking journey with someone. But yeah, you, you're selling that's plausible where shit fiction. That's to break down, I guess. Well, yeah. it's, it's a difficult one, you know. Uh, it's one of the things I think about all the time is, is it better to have ignorant, happy people, even on a tiny level, to having informed, unhappy people? And look as a perfect example of the, a lot of the kind of hack you find in street performance. The, the tennis racket, for Go example. Uh, the tennis racket, the thing I've kind of made my living doing. It's an easy thing to do. Anyone can do it. You can go straight it's through it. It's the way it. you do it. It's the way you do it, surely, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a skeleton for a performance, yes, but it, it's put elected on a lie that is never disclosed, you know? Do you understand That's what I mean? Lie. Go on. Now, can that be the revelation? Well, what you the the lie is that you... Sorry, I was just what was that? Sierra ate all the bread for the hummus, so I'm about hungry. But go on, so Oh, yeah. you've got a scoop. You're down to scoop. Yeah. <laughs> but go on. So, so it's predilected on a lie. Go on. That was interesting. Uh, so like that. It's, it's a predilection on a lie. You know, it's it, when a magician shows you a trick, and I've said this a few times in other stuff, when a magician shows you a trick, yeah. he tells you it's a trick. But when, yeah. for example, a freak show performer does a performance, he tries to sell something as being extremely difficult, which isn't. And you even get that yeah. in television. You get editing, you know. I'm even looking at the moment to editing some of the week's interviews I have down into shorter interviews that people can watch. And then you have yeah. to think about doing it in there. It becomes this creative process. The world yeah, yeah, is kind yeah. of sold on lots of different layered fictions. 
you know, yeah. that you invite people into accepting. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it's, just, it's about that presentation of it, you know. It's like uh, the best quote around art, man. It's uh, on, on, on the wall of the College of Art and Design in Leipzig. It has a huge fucking quote that says, uh, art is making something out of nothing and then selling it. It's a Frank Zappa quote. And yeah. it's really fucking cynical, but it really kind of nails it of being like, actually, you could be... One argument that says you'd be the most talented artist in the world, but if nobody's buying it, it has no value, you know? And it's super capitalistic yeah. and super, like, boiling yeah. it down to that thing. But the thing is, it's the thing about, like, do you, are you going to buy it or not? Are you going to believe what somebody's doing or not? And that's the thing, man. People can, yeah, people can sell you any old trash and, like, people can, like, convince you of anything but it's whether people buy so, into it or not. So is this the thing that, would you say something is art if it isn't bought? You know, so if someone makes a painting on a wall and doesn't sell that, is, does it only become art once it's commodified? Well, this is the thing. It depends on which way you are valuing this stuff. As someone who's written two books that have sold very, very poorly, <laughs> but been read by lots and lots of people because like, a lot of people buy them and pass them around and like it works yeah. on a different system. It's a problem with having of, an anarchist, uh, uh, anarchist uh, readership. You know, I appreciate then, the irony. Not, appreciate the you know, yeah. loose concepts of property. You know, like loose concepts of property. The same thing of being involved with, like you know, like the when you enter into like the world of squatting or the world of like you know, I've been an active squatter for ten years plus, and it's largely around like you enter into an area which is not valued by market principles. And um, in the theatre of the oppressed, like in the workshops that we do, we don't use this even good bad valuation we don't use better or worse even we talk about things in terms of are they curious and interesting so is whatever is happening is it interesting is it stimulating me does it does it draw my attention that could be really really bad shit man that could be really like you know like <laughs> you know when you see a performance that is an absolute fucking car crash yeah and you literally can't walk away to see someone to see someone die on stage yeah. or to see their performance yeah. like hammer into the ground is like yeah. painful visceral but certainly interesting it's certainly an interesting thing you know and like yeah. this is the uh, something that i would encourage like it would be, be better to be extremely an extremely good attempt and fail than a safe mediocrity through it, you know? Like, uh, and, and, but you only get that with like, actually taking those chances, taking those risks as a performer, writer, artist, blah, blah, blah. And it can mean a long time. It can mean forever in the desert. It can mean forever in the fucking desert, never yeah. being valued monetarily. You might never make a fucking penny out of it. But... Yeah. If you really believe in what you're doing and that's the artwork that you want to create, then like it is, uh, there is no price you can really put on it. Uh, like Bukowski is, uh, we're talking about writer writers, yeah? So Bukowski's a great example of it where he plowed away year after year after year and then uh, thought, fuck it, got, never got good responses, so took 10 years off to drink and just went off. Oh, this is his story, whether it's true or not. But he took 10 years out just to drink and drink and drink, and then he got back into it. And really, he kept plugging away, writing exactly what he wanted to write, still sending them out, still like being completely unapologetic with his style, with his process, with his content, which was, you know, it was really vilified for many years. And then in his 50s, in his 60s, his 70s, he became huge. He became fucking huge, and like even now, he's like probably one of the seminal uh, authors, like writers, poets. Like I didn't even like poetry until I read some of his stuff. You know, someone gave me a copy of one of his poetry books, and I read it through, uh, and it changed my perception of what poetry could be because it wasn't all like flowers and rainbows and blah blah blah. It was the like visceral, real stuff about living in terrible urban environments. And having no hope and still managing to create despite that. And that kind of connected, I think. 
Yeah, that's important. Yeah. Stuff, yeah. And just a, a point on this is, say if he was never discovered, say if he never had the, for want to give it a modern term, subscription that people have nowadays. Say, for example, somebody sees, you know, two million in a couple of days. Bukowski makes his contemporary work at this time that's seen by nobody and it drifts off into into nothingness. Is that still a valuable piece of work? Is that work still was it worth still worth him doing it? Well, this is the thing, right? What what he would say about it is if you're doing it for anyone else, if you're doing it for the crowds, if you're doing it for the for, for like the applause, if you're doing it for the validation of other people, if you're doing it to be seen, if you're doing it for like a, 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 a awards or reviews or anything else, that do it. That's what he would say. He'd say, don't fucking do it. If that's the reason you're doing it, stop yeah. and do yeah, something yeah. else, you know? Yeah. And like, it's pretty fucking visceral, but like, that, that for me meant a lot to read that stuff and just be like, actually, you know, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of the stuff, you know, I've written lots of fucking zines and lots of stuff that no one's ever seen, you know? Nobody ever hears. Even now, I, I write a lot of poetry and we, we work like our... Uh, quarantine lockdown responses we have a lot of music equipment in our front room and fortunately have like a small number of musicians who are like locked in together in the place yeah the joy, so the joy of being to work on that yeah the joy of being in a community locked in you know um this i got it. really i i got sick with uh, the kind of the group dynamics that can become prevalent in big community spaces at some points but fuck me would i yeah. not mind being in one right now you know, yeah. ha having yeah. a community that you can hang out with as opposed to just, not just as opposed to talking to you on this screen here, you know, yeah. and drink it, drinking a wine. So, so, I mean, it's good to see yeah. you. And this is the thing. It's, yeah. um, it's, it's a mixed blessing uh, from the from the squatters communities. Yeah. Uh, we hear uh, definitely like, a lot of stories around like it, it's difficult to balance. I mean, in ours, we are reasonably um we're very lax in a way it's people still do visit uh and we allow it we do like distancing within the house and we do like hand washing and all of that but there is still some yeah. fluidity which is socially unacceptable what are you doing what what yeah. they start getting harassed by someone there um but like um <laughs> it is that balance that we do still have people around in order to do it but you can feel it like this thing of cabin and like the way that people start to react to each other in our space like we're about seven eight people and we have a a building next door with a few more people that we you know there is some interaction between the two spaces um but you can feel it in we hear stories about other places where people are um having difficulties really defending their space and defending it in the way that they want in terms of people coming in and out or balancing it but they're um and so just emotions this are really is, high emotions so are really is, very high with it you know so just from a outside perspective but you know reasonably informed i was inside uh, occupations for many years and years and years um I don't really so remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um so can we talk about that are we going to talk about that yeah or, uh, yeah we could talk about it but just on this story here my perspective on it is that maybe inside the space will be people who want lockdown actual yeah. lockdown you go out to walk your dog you get your exercise in the building if it's big enough. Otherwise, you know, you go out only when you fucking need to. Absolutely fucking have to. Yeah. Because it is, you know, the the kind of more politically activist -y kind of people who were pushing earlier for this stuff. A lot yeah. of people, because they were used to the idea of working together as a group and, you know, we, not the me, you know, for, <laughs> for everything. It's a great saying that comes from a Navy SEAL, and it's so oh, yeah. it comes from it comes from a very militarist militaristic kind of perspective. But they yeah. all have that common chiming thing of working together for stuff, so it seems we more natural. Would, uh, uh, we we would use the term uh, eco, not ego. So uh, yes. what what are we doing for the ecology around us rather than our yeah. personal egos? And this is the balance. Is like you know I have a lot of very uh, calm conversations with people explaining my pers my perspective on why there's these conflicts and why people have differences of opinion on it and like yeah. accepting like some of the messiness like i think this is the thing is that um you know it's 
it's going to be an imperfect practice. I think there's a lot of debate around like uh, complete self isolation and the problems that's causing because we're seeing already like a big jump in uh, uh, addiction issues in terms of like uh, uh, depression, in terms of like domestic violence, in terms of like, all these things that still require there to be interaction and communication between our communities and an op- you know, an openness to being like it's not quite as simple as lock the doors and fuck everybody and like we're you know that's not going to yeah. work in the long term but, either. But maybe you know? this is the the reason why we need to collectively reach out in different mediums, like you know these mm. kind of mediums talk with each other, build community in I different think... networks. You know, um, mm. yeah. Uh, have you guys thought about doing some kind of? Do you have flats overlooking you? Do you have um, residents overlooking you? Do you have a community of people around who can see you from a roof? I mean, I've been talking and chatting with people about the idea of going and trying to perform in some way for the people around you, trying to use. Oh my god! Yes, yeah. yes, we do. Yes, oh my goodness! Yeah. Yes, we do. So we already have like we we we, um, we back onto the railway lines, and there's a big residential block opposite us of like uh, several hundred units. Organized. We already have a bit of like call and response with people in those units, like very basic, like, like good morning London and blah blah blah, and a bit of shout, <clears throat> a bit of shouting back and forth. But like where we, what where we have is actually a perfect platform for exactly that, and that's genius. I hadn't actually considered that at all. Um, yeah, we definitely have the space and the ability to do that. Yeah, um, <laughs> but where, uh, we'd, yeah, that'd be a longer story of like how to sort of attract all those people. But yeah, definitely we've sort of waved back and forth uh, a lot of people. And we're very lucky that we have access to a roof terrace like that, and actually several of them over the back. And of these you have buildings. you have multiple people with skills there who can do stuff. That's one of the problems is that we can't all meet up and do something. You know, you can't yeah. really go and film much because you can't be able to go and do filming. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. difficult. Um, yeah, it, I, it has has to be a balance. It has to be a sort of sane balance, you know. I think that's because that's yeah. the thing. Like we we still have like I think these reasonable precautions in terms of like you know uh, our interactions with other people, um, but also you know the the intention with all of this is to not pretend that we aren't all going to get infected at some point. It is to slow the rate of those infections and to take responsibility for it being like, but eventually we're all going to get it. And, but it's just so we all don't get it at once. So in the meantime, yeah, like, uh, I, I, you know, I'll be honest with you. Like, I mean, my mental health has been suffering massively just from my, the day to day of like being trapped in the same space and trying, it's why I signed up for these things, you know, is like to try and do something different, try and access different ways that may seem remotely positive. But, um, yeah, it's uh, in the same way I rode a bike out in order to get here to a space where I could do it, you know. Was that essential? Well, arguably not, you know, but like, it's yeah, I think uh, it has to be that same balance with it, you know. Uh, well, we're all making our choices, you know, um, on what we do and how we're doing it. And I'm sure that you're, if you're staying in a place every single day, you're making a, a massive... Uh, uh, commitment to try and help other people which is a good thing um this will end this will end look historically historically throughout history these things <laughs> gonna... hey, go on. <laughs> some more uh, small uh, small animal loose in there um really well, well, uh... You think it'll end? I don't know. Okay, go ahead. You think, go, go with this one and I'll well, do the counterpoint if you like. Let's, uh... let's look at this. 19, uh, 1918, best parallel I know of, of what's going mm. on now. It lasted Basically. for a couple of years. It ended. We then had, you know, massive depressions after, but then things went up and down and up and down and up and down as they seem to. So my my postulation is that thing, this will end. It'll last for probably a shorter time than 1918 flu epidemic because we are better equipped to deal with it, despite the fact that we are not equipped to completely deal with it, you know, and then we'll go through a depression and then we'll have to come back out of that again and figure out yeah, how to live our lives. Yeah. Economic depression and also maybe a cultural depression because people won't be meeting up in large groups for such a prolonged time 
and maybe there will be a a sort of uh, a taboo on doing it after um, we do yeah. have the lifting of quarantine. So who knows? You know, I, I think it'll be a gradual return to something comparable to what was before. Um, but then we're all in right now. And so that's one of the interesting things, I think, about doing this thing of trying to entertain people in blocks of flats. If you can, if I they're like around that. you and I you can like frame that. it and you can provide something positive for them, you don't need to earn fucking nothing out of it. You know, I've got my ideas but, of what I want to do. I'm not going to ask for fucking money. You just do it because you want to give something positive but, but during this, this is the shitty thing as well, time. That, um, you've seen it in uh, Spain. Spain already is going to bring in universal basic income. And actually, you know, everything that's happened with, with the Tory government, you've probably already talked about this stuff already, so forgive me if I'm repeating but with the Tory government bringing in some of the most socialist economic reforms that have ever existed, ever, 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 and so on this morning, that shows you how fundamentally society is going to change. And I don't think, all right, never say never, it's going to take a long-ass time for it to flip back the other way. But you want to put on your tinfoil hat, I have like I do have a bit of a theory that I think is worth sharing about all of this, which Go is it, a, and it's not lizards or five G before we jump there, but it is to do with if you had do you remember this twelve year thing with the uh you know with that thing that we were, the climate yeah you remember the thing we had twelve years to save the climate before it reached like a final tipping point that we wouldn't be able to return back from yeah. And it's like if you wanted to fundamentally change the way that society works and all individual choices work, if you wanted to like change that very, very fucking quickly and permanently, yeah, like you, so that like there was no more flights, that actually air pollution dropped off to nearly zil, that like all of these kind of things happened overnight. This is exactly the way you would do it. This is, if you want to think about, like, maybe, maybe, maybe this needed to happen in the long term if people were thinking about, hmm, actually, the planet's fucked, and if we want anyone to survive beyond a certain point, we're going to have to radically change it, and overnight, this is exactly how you do it. It's Agreed, working, right? but then also, as well, if you wanted to have a booming year in, uh, in sales in Torquay, this would also make sense. So why haven't they done it? You know, it's just because it's been, got a, What? A year, a year in sales in Torquay? Like, what are you talking Torquay about? Torquay or Newquay, you know. So if you had some holiday destination, yeah, it would make complete sense for them to make this virus and then release this virus because it would be within their you interest think people to do it. What, you think the New Key Tourist Board has, like, developed coronavirus as a way of, like, getting people down there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lizards. To... All right. Well, I win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First one. All right. Well, look, I'm just saying that there's also that aspect of it that you know maybe fundamentally everything did have to change, and maybe actually this is the best thing that ever happened. You know, maybe this is like, all right, it's going to be. Oh, we won't be able to go on holidays to Thailand or whatever. Oh, it's, you're like exponentially rich, and oh, you may accidentally infect all of your friends with some kind of virus. But actually, that was always a thing anyway, you know, that was always a thing. And it might not be, like, particularly easy to, like, you know, uh, digest that change. But like, there is an argument that it really, really needed to happen. That really the way that we were all living and we were all existing was actually fundamentally flawed and on a fucking clock anyway, you know. Like, there was already stuff with the flights with consumerism, with like, all this kind of awareness of like, you know, like, well, the, way, the way the entire world is set up, that actually it was a matter of time until this shit happened, and now it has. I, I mean, actually, it's, I'm kind of glad I don't have to go to work in a way. You know? yeah, I kinda can I ask like, you something? Right, well, yeah, Do you on. feel a responsibility as an artist to, uh, to have some influence right now? What kind of influence, you know? Uh, do you think do you think a uh, position of an artist is one that's important now? Yeah, I mean I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Like to be honest, the urge to like bail even on this, even on just having conversations around on it that other people could listen in on, even on the all I wanted to do was be a proper Benjamin and like run away from it, you know? And Benjamin is a reference to the donkey in Animal Farm who like 
couldn't couldn't be asked to like call out stuff is it you know? but i'm like nah i'll still turn up i'll still have a go and still uh you know have a chat with it and nice to, you know to see you as well like, it's been a long yeah. time so yeah really come in and have a chat and yeah, yeah. But, but you know it's a like, uh kind of keep that like thread yeah that's the that's the respect like, without artists we can't imagine what the world would be it's the it's not mm-hmm. the responsibility of politicians to do that artists as creators are the ones who have to envision how the world might be and to literally create it. So yeah, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that step might be. And partly it is, I told you a little story about like, what if it was all the plan to save the entire planet? That's a little bit of fucking artistry for you. Yeah. Yeah. Free. Feel free to donate to my non-existent Patreon. Yeah. Do you have a PayPal? (laughs) No, it's all right. I'm not really doing it for the money. I'll be right. Apparently, the government are like, ooh, we should yeah. talk about as well. If you are a, uh artist uh, or someone uh, self-employed, uh, the Arts Council have got their uh, grant application thing open in two rounds at the moment for £80 million for you to claim up to £2,500 for lost earnings during this period. It's open from now until the 16th, and then from the 16th till another one. Uh, yeah, the the server is working and everything. So for the if anyone who is watching or listening who is involved, uh, then that, that's well worth an application. It's like three paragraphs that you fill in and then ask them for the money. The same, uh, everyone I know who's been applying for universal credit is basically saying that you ring up, tell them you have no money, and then they send you money. So you have to be on the I phone. Can, I between. can confirm that. I, I've, Go I've got, yeah, I got it dropped. Um, I was on the journal. I tried the journal route because I couldn't get through on the phone. I just could not fucking get through. I sat for six hours, yeah. and then after that, I a noticed after a few days they changed their technique to the phone automatically turning off on you. It would lead you oh, to wow. a menu and say, "Too busy, turn off," and you yeah, have to yeah. keep grinding through all of that to Shit. try and get on to hold. Um, so I read on somebody else's Facebook. You go um, into the journal and you can read comments in the journal. And so I left over the weeks the escalating comments of, I have this much money left in the bank. I'm really worried now. Can you please help me? I need help now. You know, after like, after coming up to two weeks, I got a call um, and they said, Yeah, no worries. Read out your bank details, read out my bank details. And then they said, Right, money should be in. It was in on the Monday. Yeah, I'm, this I'm is the gonna... thing to remember is yeah. not to panic and not to yeah. panic is that actually the government owes us because the government has fucked all of this up yeah so the reason why there is suddenly so much money available is because they are terrified yeah that if they don't fucking pay us is what they owe us that we will be round their fucking houses getting it, yeah? And that's the reason suddenly you've seen like this big fight. Suddenly, like homelessness is not a problem. Suddenly, there's enough money for everyone. Of course, it fucking is, yeah? Because they know that if they don't get on top of this, then people are gonna, yeah, they'll be out in the streets for the wrong kind of reasons. And you think that, like, piggy, ploddy policeman is gonna be able to stop that where there's a bunch of starving, virus infected, frenzied motherfuckers out in the street? No, nah, man, they'll give us everything we want. So please, everybody, claim all the fucking money which they stole from us, yeah? And that uh, it is not a benefit. It is not, like, an award or anything like that. They fucked up, and they owe us, yeah? So, like, uh, please, yeah, don't, don't, they'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it all back, yeah? Because that's the flip side of the opportunity of what's happening now. Right, there's been a big upsurge in this idea around mutual aid. There's been a big transformation in terms of everything's going to be different. But it can really only go, well, we'll do it in a binary, two different ways. One in which they're running it and controlling it, and we're all scared and alone and locked in our little boxes whilst they fucking live fat off of what we created. And the other one is where we totally fucking flip that bitch, and it becomes a completely different thing. And it's very exciting times in terms of seeing which way it's going to go. And all these little chats and connects and communications are all a big part of that, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think uh, people being able to share their opinions, people being able to see what other people are thinking, what other people's drives are right now, how they're coping, what they're planning, is a good thing. It's a positive thing. I... I don't think there's going to be revolution, you know, and we differ on this thing. I, no, I no, kind no, of, no, yeah. 
just means to spin around, man. You don't need to. Yeah. We don't need to uh, have a revolution. Like, we don't need to spin around. But what we do need is to completely uh, progress. <laughs> we need we need progress. We don't need to be spinning around anymore. We need to move forward with things, you know. Yeah. And I don't have any plan or like, outlay or anything like that with it. I'm going to do my thing. Other people can have a think about what they want to do. That's their choice. But the opportunity is great. What? I've been photographed by an influencer. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's, like, it's up to everyone to make their own choices on it. But certainly I'm going to have my opinion on it. And certainly like, people should really, really think about what crisis is opportunity, you know? Uh, make it be uh, a revolution. Like. <laughs> so are you going to do this thing on the roof? Are you going to go up on the roof, try and get people, do a kind of show? I'm going to think about it, you know. I'm going to think about it. Like, that's the thing. I um, I try not to do too much right now. And uh, I try not to have too high expectations. Like, the way we're pro- progressing is around, as we always have done, like, little by little, these kind of increments of it, you know. So, um, if, uh, definitely the opportunities there. Uh, what we're very interested in at the moment is this, uh, as we see an increase, as I said, in terms of domestic violence, depression, suicide, drug addiction, all of that, like things that are not directly related to coronavirus, like you don't have the virus, but you have the social repercussions of it. How do we provide support and stability for people and space for them? And we're trying to do that through squatting, but obviously there's a lot of things, uh, complicated within that. So, that's where we are as well. I'm also doing a lot around, you know, actually need to uh, uh, look after myself quite a lot as well. I make sure that I'm all right. So I encourage everyone to do as well. This idea around self and collective care, doing the things that look after yeah. each other, but also really prioritizing the things that look after ourselves. Can I can uh, I uh, bring this up? So just a question. Are they going, are courts going easy on you now because of what's going on? Are they... Are you getting a uh, stay of execution or? So, yeah, there is a the government announced a 90 day moratorium uh, ban on all evictions, uh, which some people are interpreting as, um, you know, just on the uh, tenants and things as well. So there should be no evictions for 90 days. During last week, we saw two illegal evictions within 90 uh, within. 24 hours, one in Brighton and one in Peckham, where the police and people claiming to be bailiffs like turned up and booted people out. So, but really the government advice is that there should be no evictions during the next three months. Uh, and you, you can look on freedom.org.uk uh, to find articles that explain the law on that. There has been a, a court a CPR reference, a CPR 51Z, I think it is, that talks about how uh, there should be no evictions during this time. And I'll repeat that, no evictions during the next three months, even though, and if any of them are, they're illegal, and if any you do are aware of them, please intervene with them and push back and tell the bailiffs to fuck off or tell whoever they're doing them so, to fuck uh, off. So you, are you talking about... And also, about, just on that as well, yeah. like in the courthouses yeah. as well, the court system has completely overwhelmed uh, I heard there was a backlog of 32,000 cases already like where, because of what's happening with everything, the whole judicial process is breaking down. And it's not, so it's not just the health, everything, everything is on the brink, not just the health service, which should go, could go any day. That's the reason why there's been such a strong response, is that the whole fucking NHS could collapse and you you see bodies in the fucking streets. They're already preparing for it. All of the measures right now, all the stay-at-home stuff, is literally buying time to maintain the level of fucking societal organisation that we have right now. Not to be scaremongering or anything like that, but like just to be clear on that's exactly if, what's happening. If we do, do get, you know, well. if we do get this thing coming in like it's coming in other countries, then yeah, we will get problems for a long time. I'm glad we're all staying in myself, oh, you know. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to get this thing back onto just some artistic output and stuff, you know. Um, oh, yeah. We're artists. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to have this thread you kind of draw back onto at some point. Um, so when you're writing and you write your books, 
how do yeah. you approach that? Um, yeah. What were they? A bit of information about them. I'll leave you to kind of, you know, elaborate more on that. Yeah. So both books, they're both creative nonfiction. They were um, semi-therapeutic processes where I was writing about shit that had happened to yeah. me, but also writing about stuff that had happened to my friends. Uh, stories around like uh, evictions, uh, around experiences around a friend of ours killing himself, uh, around mental health, drug addiction, fighting the law, fucking cops, generally being naughty, generally doing all these kind of things. And then being like, well, actually, there wasn't a lot of stories around that uh, being written at the time. And also it's like, well, yeah, they were good. They were the same kind of stories that I tell all the time to my mates anyway. So I was like, why not write them down and share them? So a lot of it was around just getting out of your own way and just letting it flow, you know, letting it be the thing that happens, writing it all out, editing a bit on hindsight and everything, but generally uh, allowing that stuff just to come out. Uh, like I said, lots of people might have read them, but not so many people might have bought them. So if you do want to bung us some cash, I believe they're available from Waterstones and all good bookshops and things. But, uh, yeah, we can yeah, put the link in. Good times at- Good times in dystopia in particular, I am gutted that it talks about like climate collapse, all this kind of bullshit, uh, fighting cops, evictions, mental health, capitalism, suicide, a global pandemic disease. It doesn't quite mention, so I'm a little bit gutted that I didn't get in there, unless, of course, capitalism is the real disease, you know, for... But yeah, so if people could check that out, that would help us out a lot. I think you could buy it as like an ebook. If you don't have any money, just get in touch. I'll send you a copy for free anyway, because I'm nice like that, you know. But, uh, mm. but yeah, they came out pretty nice. I'm pretty pleased with them. Like, uh, I don't really know what he wants to say. Very influenced by Bukowski, uh, by Philip K. Dick, uh, by like the blurring of different realities, uh, by that kind of like. Uh, got a punk kind of aesthetic uh yeah 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 i I enjoyed writing them a lot cool mate well um i think it's a natural point to tie a bow in the interview thank you for chatting it's been a real pleasure chatting with you um thanks for having us matt i enjoyed it hey no worries mate um if you hang on in a second when we end the thing we can have a chat after and just buddy chew the fat a little bit more for now thank you everybody have a good one goodbye 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 bye everyone